Um, so, so what are we talking about? We started last time and we're continuing this time. What was our topic we introduced last time? Ethics. ethics yeah, there we go. <laughs> ethics. Wasn't just the squid game. Um, ethics, yeah. So we are going to be discussing ethics. And we're going to basically continue with what we started with last time, which is just, well, what did we say the definition of ethics was? Let's just remind ourselves. There we go. Study of morality. And what did we say morality was? Yeah, it's the, it's the thing that governs what's good or bad, right or wrong. So we said some examples of moral questions are things like, should you, is it ever okay to murder? Is the squid game all right? Um, all those sorts of things. So yeah, that's what we're gonna be talking about. And last time we also mentioned basically some things that morality is not. It's not just saying whether you like something or your opinions on it. It's also not just, um, it's not just saying what your society's norms are. It's not just saying like, this is how we do things. The fact that we, you know, don't face each other on elevators. It's an immoral issue. It's just something we all do. Um, the lines between them are sometimes blurry. Like I consider the person who gets on the subway before the people on the subway get off the subway. I consider that a deep moral crime. Um, but uh, other people don't feel as strongly, but it's certainly, you know, it's not quite murder. So uh, I'll, I'll grant you that one. So um, what we're going to be talking about today, though, is the is basically the next step, which is going to be, how do we go from this question of the study of morality, what's good, what's bad, to practically speaking, how do you decide on a given case, what's the right thing to do? And what are different theories that people have for how you do that? So different people have different views about what makes something right and what makes something wrong, and therefore how you, in a particular case, can go about deciding what the right or wrong thing to do is. And I think the best way of doing this or bringing out these ideas is to just start off by looking at a particular example that I think is rather people have generally strong intuitions about. And the idea is, let's look at a simple case. Let's see why in this simple case, we think there's a right thing to do and a wrong thing to do. And then from there, draw some general conclusions that maybe we can use from this case to generalize to other sorts of cases. So like all these other cases are gonna be ones where they might not be the exact same, but the same principles we use, the same way of deciding what's right or wrong that we use in the first case can be used in this other case as well. So, um, why is nothing, nothing is working out so stuff. Uh, nope, now I need this board because of course I do. Yeah. Oh, now I do. Things are going great up here, don't mind me. Uh, all right, so I'm going to, um, well, out of curiosity, how many of you before you had the reading or before this class had heard of the trolley problem? Just out of curiosity, had people heard of the trolley problem? All right, we've got two here. How many, Corin has any other computer people? Nope. All right, so I'm not going to jump right into the trolley problem because I think the trolley problem is actually a less clear case than other versions which illustrate the same thing. So I'm going to go with like a uh, extreme case. So imagine that you are, uh, I don't know, let's just go, you're James Bond or somebody else in an, a stupid action movie where the bad guy has control of a missile silo. So imagine the bad guy, whoever this bad guy is, it's the worst missile ever, but you get the general idea. And on this missile with its little rocket ship bits, um, it's a nuke. So you've got a nuclear weapon attached to this missile. Now you having broken in here as James Bond or whatever other action hero you wanna think of, have gotten here and have realized that this thing is set to launch. And the system has already begun. The rockets have started to fire. You can't shut it off. And as of right now, it is directed towards New York City. And if this nuke goes off in New York, if you do nothing, this nuke is going to, in about 30 seconds, fly out of the super secret James Bond filled dungeon and uh, blow up in New York City. However, there's this big button here that seems to have been designed for running tests of the missile. And when you look at it, it turns out that this button, if you press it, it redirects the missile. And instead of flying at New York, it instead flies westwards and lands on a little island in the middle of the Pacific. And this little island in the middle of the Pacific written next to the button, it tells you a little bit about it. And living here is just one guy, um, I don't know, we'll name him Craig. And Craig lives here on this island with like 
You know, he hated his job, so he moved to an island and there was no one around. So here's the question. How many of you, there's two different questions. So if you, just to describe the case, if you do nothing, this missile is gonna launch and hit New York City. If you press this button right here, the nuke is gonna go the other way and land on this island where Craig lives. Um, as to your, it's a very small island. It's in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific. Like you'll probably mess up migratory bird routes and Craig's life, but everybody else, there's no other humans around. So how many of you, two different questions. How many of you would press the button is the first question. And then the second question is how many of you think the right thing to do is to press the button in this situation? They come apart somewhat, which is why I wanted to separate them. So first off, how many of you would press the button? Press the button, the nuke goes that way and lands on Craig's island. How many of you would press the button? All right, so all five of us here, Ryan, Gotti, three participants, so we got three. Okay, so most people who are responding would press the button. Um, is there anyone who would not press the button? Anyone who wouldn't? Okay. okay, Amanda would not press the button. So we have one person who would save Craig. Um, and I'm gonna call on you in a minute, Amanda, about what your reasons are on this. Now, a separate question is, how many of you think the right thing to do is to press the button? I, I do feel the right thing to do. So the reason I, I don't, I, I have some people who just, uh, oh, you press your, Amanda's not over here. She just pressed her hand like, okay. All right, you don't love, nobody loves Craig. Not even his mom, that's why he lives on an island. Um, so, uh, so how many of you think the right thing to do is to press the button in this case? I feel that it is. Uh, the reason I bring this up is some people have a feeling of there's no right or wrong. It's just two crappy situations. Other people have the feeling of it's the right thing to do, but I, I just don't have the courage to press the button. I just want to run away and hide. So this is the reason I bring it up. Um, so let's now go, those of you who either said it's the right thing to do, or which I guess is everybody, or that you would do it, even if you're not so sure it's the right thing to do. Simple answer or simple question is why? Why do you say press the button and send it at Craig instead of sending it at New York? And I did not a trick question or anything, just straight up going for it. Well, I mean, firstly, it's one person versus like millions of people. But secondly, it's the, it's the same thing as um, that social psychology that we were talking about, the in-group and out-group idea, where New York City, why would we want to say that we're well, New York City when we're here? I think it would be a different question if you said Europe or something. Well, that's actually a good question. Let's change this one. Let's see if people's intuitions change out of curiosity. Let's make this, let's make the, the numbers bigger, but different in-group, out-group. Actually, no. We're, there's probably some people in the <laughs> class who have personal connections to Beijing. Uh, let me think. Where's a large city that nobody in this class is likely to have any connection to? Uh, see, what obscure but large city can we find? Um, Prague? Prague. Prague's a good one. Prague. We're going with Prague. Prague in the Czech Republic. I don't think we have anyone Czech, but there's a few million people living there. Um, so again, it's not quite as big as New York, but you're still going to be, you know, sending a nuke at a few million people. So, um, yeah, Sudan is, is, I, I don't know if the nuke would be big enough to blow up all of Sudan. Um, so yeah, let's go with Prague and the Czech Republic. Do people's intuitions change? Because I think you're right. The in-group, out-group might, might do it. I still don't think, I still think I'd kill Craig. I think it makes it easier to decide to kill Craig. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right here. It's like, you know. So part of it is, I think, and I think you just pointed out like a, a flaw in my initial experiment. But if we go with Prague, I think, how many people still feel we blow up Prague? Like, or would press the button? Or I mean, not blow up Prague, blow up Craig yeah. instead of Prague? Yeah. Um, so most people still, so what is our reason for it? The first thing we have is one person versus, I don't know, if anyone wants to look up the population of Prague, feel free, but I'm just gonna put up some millions. Um, so yeah. So this I think is part of it, is this first one person versus, how many? 1.3. 1.3, okay, so 1.3 million. Okay, so let's give them 1.4. Let's say they had a lot of babies. Uh, <laughs> COVID, you know, <laughs> what else? Suppose completely off track, supposedly um, whenever, so do you remember, uh, or have you heard there was like a big blackout in New York City in the seventies and everyone lost power. Supposedly when you looked at the birth rates nine months later, there was a little spike from, <laughs> from the, the blackout night because nobody had anything else to do. Um, so yeah, uh, so yeah, Prague 1.4 million. Most people would rather send it towards Craig. 
Does anyone have any other reasons about why you would send it towards Craig as opposed to Prague? Gotti, is that a hand from before or is that a, a question? Oh, no, that was from before. My bad. Okay. Corin. Um, well, for a while, I thought you meant like another city versus New York. And I would probably, just my gut reaction is to like see which one has the least amount of people. Um, so that would be sort of like a, a general rule if I was gonna, you know, apply an answer to this problem, so. Yeah, it seems like the numbers of people there really matters to us. Now, is the number of people the only thing? So let's imagine for a second, um, I think that, uh, Let's go back to the New York case, but let's imagine, just because I want to get the numbers up a little higher, and also imagine you're not from New York, you have no connection to New York, just imagine another world. What's another reason though, other than just the 8 million people that you might want to send it at Craig instead of New York? Not just the numbers of people, but what other things? Is it just the people or? What are some other things that might happen if we send it to New York that wouldn't happen if we send it at Cray? Also, the influence New York has on the world. Like, one person where, like, you know, you've got Wall Street Center, you have Wall Street, you have here. Yeah, I think another thing is the financial and political implications, political implications, where I think that even if the biggest thing is the number of deaths, is like clearly the most salient. You can't ignore the fact that if you blow up Craig's Island, you're not gonna like destroy the world financial system in the way you would if you blew up New York City. And that would have many implications worldwide. So it wouldn't just be that 8 million people died. It would be that several billion other people's lives were just completely thrown into chaos. And you have like celebrities, you have like the um, like politicians, you have all those kind of people too. Yes, yeah, so it's, and it's also then, again, the trickle down effects of, yeah, Craig, Craig's mom will be sad, but, um, but again, he left her to live on an island, so maybe not even that sad. So, um, yeah, so it seems like over here, we've got 8 million people, financial and political implications, uh, celebrities and things who have influence on the world, more generally speaking. So if we were to sum this up in two words, why do you choose, or like one phrase, what is it about this one? What's worse in this case than in this case? There's more damage. Damage or consequences. It seems like in our initial gut feeling, why do we choose one over the other? It looks like a major determiner in our decisions are the consequences. And it seems like, con I can't spell, consequences. I... So I think most humans, even the few people in my last class who said they wouldn't press the button or the right thing to do wasn't to press the button, for them, they even, they felt that they, they still felt the pull of the fact that there's reasons to go with this one. It's rather that they were offset by things like it's wrong to, like I couldn't get up the courage to know that I actively pressed a button that caused someone to die. Uh, so even those people though recognize the 8 million. Um, number. And, and I think there, there are things to say, and we'll talk a bit more at the end about why the intuition, I think, of that pressing the button is somehow more directly involved than just stepping away is getting on to something, but I'm not sure it comes out too strongly in this case, just because we're dealing with buttons. So yeah, consequences. So it seems like one of the major things that we take into account when deciding what is right and wrong in a simple, straightforward case is the consequences. Now, anyone guess based on um, the way that people generally come up with their names for theories, anyone wanna take a guess for what a theory of ethics that believes that what's right or wrong is always determined by the consequences is? Consequ Consequentialism. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> consequentialism. This is consequentialism, very close. Consequentialism. This is a view of ethics according to which what's right or wrong is always determined by the consequences. It is a very common view. So the way in which you've got two options, you, have, you can decide either to hold the door for someone or not hold the door for them when you're in a hurry. How do you decide what the right thing to do is? Well, whichever one has better consequences. That's what the right thing to do is. 
So how do you decide uh, whether to join the army? Well, again, better consequences. How do you decide anything? Better consequences. So that's the general idea of consequentialism, like the biggest picture. Now, consequentialism obviously is very vague. So, you know, as somebody says, I'm a consequentialist, I believe that the right thing to do is the one with the best consequences. What's a question you're going to have almost immediately? So if somebody says, I believe that the right thing to do is the one with the best consequences, what's a question you might have for them? Yeah, what counts as the best consequences? How do you define the best consequences? And so the way to think of this with consequentialism really is, I'm going to move this a little more room to work. So we moved New York, New York just moved. Um, the, the way to think of it is, well, you've got a general type of ethical theory and consequentialism in the same way that like you have, uh, you know, there's a general type of profession athlete, but nobody's just an athlete. They're a type of athlete. In the same way, no one is just a consequentialist. You're specifically a type of consequentialist. And there's one type we're going to be discussing in this class. But before we get to that, let's draw it out a little bit. Let's try to get at the intuition which drives this view of consequentialism. Because they define what's right and wrong in a very particular way. They say there's a special way of measuring what's right and what's wrong that's going to be applied in every situation. So in our New York City case, you all brought up the 8 million people and the financial political implications and the influential deaths. I'm just going to put influential deaths, deaths of influential people. Now, what I'm going to be doing here is going in the most classic philosophical sort of question imaginable, which is asking you all to now ask the question why about some of your most fundamental well-established, we know it's true, but why sorts of things. And the question right now is, why is it worse for 8 million people to die than for one person to die? We all have some gut feeling about it, and I'm not disagreeing that our gut feeling is right, but why? What is it about this? And specifically the magnitude of what, though? Because, you know, eight million great blades of grass versus life. one life. Exactly. And here's then the next question. Why do we care about life? That's the next one. Matthew, what were you going to say? Yeah. Okay, so life. It seems like there's something about life. But specifically, what is it about the lives? Why is it that life loss is such a terrible thing? And I'm, again, not disputing that it is, just what is it that makes this the case? Well, I mean, like, they don't know that they're dead, but all these other people who know them know that they're dead. So it's going to have a bigger effect on people than... And specifically, what type of impact will it have? Grief. Grief, suffering, pain. So why is it that 8 million people dying is such a bad thing? Well, it's simply the matter of how much pain this is causing, the suffering, the grief. So it's not just uh, the, the suffering, it's the, or it's not just the number, it's the amount of pain that is going with that. Gotti, is that a hand? So I just saw you down there. Oh, yeah. Um, I was going to say, yes, on the topic of life, I think the weight of it, you know, I think the weight of a single life is already a very difficult and complex thing that someone already can't really handle. So the weight of 8 million is like not, you can't quantify that at all. Yeah, so it's a lot, it's like a huge, and what is that weighty thing? What is it? Well, I think part of it is the, the suffering that goes with the loss, but I think there's this other thing about it, Corin. Um, I am reminded of this, uh, like probably misremembered uh, quote from John Green was like, um, some infinities are bigger than others like there's an infinite amount of divisions between one and two but there's probably more between one and five depending on like how you look at it um so yeah like the loss of a life is t like horrible but if you add that many more lives but i think i not so much of the pain maybe i'm just like weird but i i think like life is probably the, the fundamental building block and the thing that we all have a vested interest in per, protecting because we are alive like being alive in sentience like 
I would rather a billion rocks get destroyed than like a single person. Though I guess, you know, that might affect the environment in different ways. And what is it about the human experience? Because I think you're spot on. So it's not just that losing these people is going to cause suffering. There's another element to it. What do we humans have the ability to do because we're human? Well, we can think, we can feel, we can have happiness. Good things can happen. Dead people can't be happy. They cannot experience good. They cannot experience pleasure. So it's not just that 8 million people's worth of suffering. It's also the loss of the potential happiness, like the loss of potential happiness for 8 million people. So it's suffering on the one hand and happiness on the other. Um, Netta, did I cut you off? Um, no, I just wanted to say that like, although as humans, we believe that like we are the most like above, you know, animals, nature, whatever, because we have the, those abilities. Yeah. So. And I think, and really, because the thing thing is, like, if a human being were not consciously aware. Like if you just had like a zombie, nobody feels bad for the zombies in the zombie apocalypse movies because they don't feel. All they do is eat brains and just like they're little robots. So in the same way, what makes it different for humans is there's this loss of potential happiness and this ad addition of a huge amounts of suffering in the world. Well, with on the flip side with Craig, Craig will be sad. Maybe his mom will be sad depending on whether they still talk or not. But, um, and Craig will no longer be able to enjoy his life out on his island. But Craig's loss of happiness is a lot less than the potential loss of happiness of the millions and millions and millions of people who would either die or be affected by a nuke going off in New York City. And so I think this is this core idea that one of the things we should care about when deciding what's right and wrong is the suffering on the one hand and the happiness on the other that will be caused by our actions. Now, has anyone heard of a moral theory or know the name of the moral, the consequentialist theory, that things the right thing to do is the one that's gonna cause the most happiness or pleasure and the least suffering or pain? Anyone know, just out of curiosity? Corin. Um, is it utilitarianism? Yeah, or... utilitarianism. So let me erase my, or send this thing flying somewhere. Use this one. Yeah. The theory is called utilitarianism. So you can think of it like this. We've got ethical theory. You can think of this as a family tree, ethical theories. And one of the types of ethical theory is a consequentialist one. The other ones we'll talk about, some of them we won't talk about, not talked about. This one will be next class. And then within consequentialist theories, there's a, oh, that's not the way an arrow goes. There are a few different types. So things we want, aren't talking about. But then one of these is utilitarianism. Utili Utilitarianism. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's a term which you might see in the news or in opinion pieces or things like that. And what utilitarianism says is in any situation, the right thing to do is whatever causes the most overall happiness slash pleasure and the least overall pain slash suffering. So this is the core utilitarian theory. And so in any situation, the right thing to do is whatever causes the most overall happiness slash pleasure, pleasure and the least overall pain slash suffering. So that's the view. Now, a hardcore utilitarian, someone, and these people do exist, believe that in any given situation, no matter what else is going on, the right thing to do is always whatever has the best overall consequences. Now, one thing I wanna highlight is this overall thing. So what do we mean by the most overall happiness 
and the least overall pain and suffering. Well, what, what I mean by overall here is that it's not just like the suffering caused to you or the people you care about. It's rather the com total sum of pleasure and pain that is brought into the world by your actions. So you have to take into account not just how this is affecting you, but how it affects your family and your friends and people you don't know and everything else and just consider it as one big whole. So because of this, with it being an overall, generally one thing this means is that causing a lot of pain to one person can in some cases be offset by causing a lot of, a little bit of pleasure to a lot of people. Does that make sense? And that's the idea here with our Craig case. We're causing immense amounts of pain to Craig, but that is being offset by all the lack of pain that is in the blowing up New York City and the potential happiness that will come around because humans in New York aren't all dying. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And so the other thing this means though, is that there can be some circumstances in which it goes the other way. If the amount of pain caused to one individual is high enough and the number of people who have pleasure from that thing isn't especially large and the amount of pleasure each one has is not especially high, then the pain of one person can offset the pleasure amounts for a lot of people, as long as those people aren't too, too, like, you know, blissful from whatever's happening. Corin. Oh, um, I was going to um, ask, like, I heard, I remember hearing that on like the FBI tests or like for to be a cop, they ask you, is the loss of one life to protect like a hundred or, you know, the good of the many, um, like worth it? And they like, don't accept you if you say yes. Like, is that true? Is there like a general accepted? Um, I, I don't that? know with, with police and FBI and those sorts of things. I do know that you have to, like, I do know there is a test that you have, like a personality test you have to take to become a cop. And it's just, it's more that they want to see the, it's not that there's a right or wrong answer to a lot of these questions. It's rather how you answer them that they really care about. So I know that like one of the questions that you get asked is something like what's worse, rape or murder? And they don't especially have any answer they want you to say. They just want you to explain your reasoning, basically just to make sure that you're not like completely... What's the best way of putting this? Your thinking on the matter is not so abnormal from the human norm as to make you a bad potential police officer. But I don't think that there's necessarily... Now, I do know that doctors have a very strict thing, which in many cases does go against consequentialism. And we can talk about that um, later on. But yeah, here's the general idea. It's just that in any situation... The, and we'll be talking about issues with this shortly, but does this all make sense? So another thing would be like, a, do a vet who says put down your dog that is in some ways a utilitarian decision like your dog's existence brings you and your family a lot of pleasure but at some point your dog's amount of pain is such that it overwhelms however much pleasure is being brought even if there's five members of your family and all of you like having the dog around the dog getting to a certain level of pain is going to be such that even though it's only one dog's pain it is going to overwhelm how much pleasure you and your family have um so yeah, so that's the general idea behind utilitarianism. Um, any questions on just what the theory is, what it says, anything along these lines? We all good? All right, where did I put my high tech eraser? All right. So what I wanna do now is as I said, a hardcore utilitarian is going to say that in any situation whatsoever, the right thing to do is the one that has the better consequences. That is always how you make your decisions. That's always the right way to do them. And that's always what defines what's the good or the right. Now, this view is something, there are some very hardcore utilitarians. However, not every ethicist and indeed few actual human beings are pure utilitarians. Now, why is that the case? So what I want to talk about now is what are some of the issues with utilitarian as a, utilitarianism as a universal theory of how we should do things? And basically what I'm asking is, the best way to see if a moral theory is right is you look at what consequences it has. Or if, if utilitarianism were, were right, then certain things would have to follow. 
Like if it was really the case that what's right or wrong is always a matter of the consequences, then we would expect that any situation in which we consider the what's right and what's wrong, our judgments, our intuitive gut feeling about what's right or wrong should track what utilitarianism says. We should only ever say that the right thing to do is the one that has the best consequences. And we should never say that something's wrong, even if, um, so we should never say something's wrong when the number of people or the amount of pleasure it causes is higher than the amount of pain. However, that doesn't seem actually to be the case. So that's one issue that I want to kind of draw out. And the other is there are some other issues with utilitarianism. So what I wanna do now is just open up to you all, computer people, 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 um, for the rest of our class time, just what are some issues that you see with thinking the right thing to do is always what's gonna cause the most pleasure and the least pain? Because I think you can think of cases in which your judgment comes across and there's also just some practical considerations. Corey. I think something where it's, like we attack somebody if we did violence or did something bad to someone that they didn't have any choice of or that wasn't already naturally happening so like oh well this is kind of an interesting example so if jeff bezos is walking around and you know we decide to mug him and take all his money and let's say jeff bezos didn't do anything wrong to acquire that money then even though it would benefit a lot of people Okay, well, that's not actually, let's say like if it would benefit like 10 people. Um, it's not right to just take something from someone without um, like any, like just do it randomly just because it would make people good. Like stealing would make a lot of people good, but like, you know, it's probably not right in general. So what you're pointing to here is what's often called the justice objection justice objection. And what this is, is it seems like one of the consequences of utilitarianism is that sometimes it says the right thing to do is to cause incredible violation to a minority of people for the well-being of the majority. And so one thing, uh, Ola Shola says you can't satisfy everyone with utilitarianism. And I think that is one issue. It's just that like, there is, and I think that ties in more with the practical issues, which I'll get to in a second, but you can think of cases in which a utilitarian would say the right thing to do is something that involves a major injustice to a single person or a small group of people. And our gut feeling is that's not right. And yet a utilitarian would say it is. Lauren. So yeah, like that's the same issue with majoritarianism in the Supreme Court. So for example, with slavery, Slavery would still be around if people would say it was utilitarian because only a small portion of the population was slaves, but most population was were white. Yeah, and so yeah, that so slavery historically speaking is one where if the numbers are small enough, you could and the the number of like if you if all the people who aren't slaves get some deep satisfaction and feel so much better about themselves because they aren't slaves and get to laugh at the five people, like imagine a society, not actual American society, where there were large numbers of slaves, but you could imagine a society in which you had like five people who were kept in cages and they were there so that everyone in the society could laugh at them and feel better about themselves then according to a utilitarian, if the amount of pleasure brought about by this laughing at the people in cages is high enough, a utilitarian is gonna have to say, therefore, the right thing to do is keep people in cages in this situation. And yet I think most gut feelings we have is that if your moral theory says, keep some people in cages so you can laugh at them, like that's not a great moral theory. Something's gone wrong here, correct. Um, that reminds me really strongly of this uh, short story called The Ones That Walk Away From Omelas. And it's about a town that's like like a utopia in, and not just in like a puritanical sense, but like everyone's deeply, truly happy. But in order for that, they have to take one kid and like, you know, um, keep them in terrible conditions, like it locked up in a basement somewhere. And um, so the thing is like, if they do something to free that kid, the town won't be like really happy. But uh, a lot of people just decide to walk away and like remove themselves from the situation instead of uh, doing either. 
Yeah, and I think one thing to say about, and this is one thing that I want to highlight. I'm glad you brought up a short story because the fact is so many of our like fictions that we love and we find so interesting, we're drawn to a lot of questions in which basically what they're doing is pitting our moral intuitions against each other. Like superhero movies, superhero comics, all of those, so much of it is just like, let us pit different moral theories against each other and have heroes who feel one thing. And very often the villain's idea is something along the lines of, we will kill this one person for the greater good. And then we have to like face, are we actually okay with them sacrificing someone for the greater good? Um, or does the superhero who refuses to kill anyone under any circumstances, even if that means the bad guy gets away, then how do we feel about this? Do we really think do we really value justice that much? Or do we think that superhero is just an idiot? Like we really, and really what it's trying to do in so many of these things is get your feelings and your intuitions out. And I think these sorts of cases show that at the very least a utilitarian is gonna say, it's very clear the right thing to do is to torture this one person. If everyone is a, if you've got a room full of sadists or a society of sadists who just love watching people get tortured, then in that society, the right thing to do would have to be to torture someone because the amount of pleasure it causes is so large. And a utilitarian says that is clearly the case. But I think as a matter of fact, for those of us who you know are human, very few people would actually say that like that's the right answer. The, most of us want to say there are certain sort of situations in which even if it's one person, and that would be offset by the larger societal consequences on a utilitarian calculation. Our gut says, but it's still not right to torture that one person. Yeah, Batman could have saved so many lives if he just was willing to kill the Joker. And I think that's like one of the cruxes of those things. It's like he's got this hardcore code of cannot kill, and therefore the Joker keeps getting out and killing people. But, and so, or would it be better if, you know, on the flip side, Batman just decides to take justice into his own hands for the greater good. But do we really want somebody without, you know, any sort of due process? What's, why is, why being, why does being the richest person in Gotham City give you the right to decide who lives and who dies? So I think that's really one of the, like, I feel like most superhero stories come down to that question of, is it ever, is, is it ever worth having a vigilante who is, under no control of a government organization to kill the bad guys for the greater good, or is it better to keep those institutions in place in order to sometimes do things or that has the consequence that sometimes worse things happen? And I think like watch any superhero movie and that's the ultimate crux, um, which is part of the reason. And the fact that this question is so tough is part of the reason why we love going back to those sorts of stories over and over and over again. Um, and there's, there's a lot of like, within literature, there's a lot of interesting things about how like the same tropes keep popping up again and again and again. And there's reason for it because we're just drawn to it as humans. All right, what are some other issues with utilitarianism? Can anyone think of some other things that come up? Um, we can talk about some practical ones. I'm just gonna put a practical issues. Um, so you decide what causes the most overall happiness and the least overall pain and suffering. Um, in a case in which you've got people dying, it's pretty straightforward. But what actually is gonna cause more pain in the universe as a whole? Um, or I guess what would cause more pleasure? To raise taxes, but provide universal health care, or keep taxes low and not provide universal health care? Which one leads to more pleasure in the world? First one. I, I think many people want to say the first one, but like, how do you measure it? Like, what is your what is your evidence for this? Like, in some sense, you've got a gut feeling, but then there are going to be other people who are like, we need our tax money. Um, how do you measure? And that might not be the best example. Or another one would be like, what's going to lead to more overall pleasure? Cutting the funding for schools or cutting the funding for medicine? What's going to cause more pain in the world? Like if you've got to do a budget cut because taxes go down because of COVID and you need to like reduce it, which one is the better one to do? Do you cut the school budget or do you cut the health or the um, the healthcare budget? How would you like, 
it seems like one issue is that like, practically speaking, utilitarianism works really, really well in certain clear cases and very much less well in other cases where it's not clear how you would even compare, like how do you compare the pain of undereducated with the pain of la difficulty with doctor access? Like how do you measure, how do you compare apples to apples and or apples to oranges or whatever the, the phrase is? Corin. <laughs> Um, I would say just because like we have a, a socialized school system and we don't have a socialized like medical like, healthcare system that um, cutting schools would do quantifiably more damage because there's not a lot of people that are relying on. Um, but I guess like the specific answer doesn't matter just the like the methodology, but I think we could use some like hard data, like what, like how many people are relying on each one of these things? What would be the consequences to figure, you know, like measure the harm? And one thing, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think one thing about utilitarianism that has become more promising in some senses is with computer technology and modeling, it does seem like to some degree we can do a bit better job of analyzing like what causes more pleasure or how many people rely on this thing but I still think there's like still a fundamental issue here of how do you measure pleasure and pain like what is worth the pain of heartbreak or the pain of getting a needle in your foot like I don't know how do you compare them like different people are going to say different things or like how do you compare the pleasure of I don't know eating a delicious meal to the pleasure of spending time with friends like I, I don't know how to compare them so I think there's this overall issue of just like practically speaking it's difficult to measure what is better and what is worse and I think it works in a lot of cases but there are some in which there's problems here look did you say the other issue is like they it's like one or the other there's no other option like it's just very limited to yeah to press the button on each other. so in that particular case I think that's the that sort of case you're really limited, but that's more a, a factor of the case. I actually think with utilitarianism in real life, the problems might be like the fact that there are infinitely many choices. So like for instance, uh, it, it leads to these some very weird consequences of like right now I am teaching you all and you are all learning. How much pleasure are we bringing into the world by doing this? I mean, some, your, your future is better, but could we do more good if all of us currently were working in a soup kitchen? Like quite possibly. So does that mean all of us should skip class and just not show up and go work in a soup kitchen? And then when you get home tonight and you're exhausted, but is going to bed, like it's bringing you some pleasure, but wouldn't you bring more pleasure into the world if you got on a plane and like brought medical supplies somewhere? Like you brought rapid COVID tests in your backpack somewhere, wouldn't that? And so it seems like one other weird consequence of utilitarianism is at any given moment, you have to do like, you have to be like an absolute human hero and never sleep. And just the expectations of the thing that causes the most pleasure being the right thing is demanding a lot from you at any given time. And it almost seems like it's demanding too much. And any moral theory that's demanding all of us never sleep and give all of our time to charity and never work, it seems like maybe that's asking too much of us. Um. I think the issue of like predicting like how you like, like you said, like um, if, if we were to go to, to volunteer in a soup or whatever, or if we, you said if you learn now, then you'll bring something, you know, in the future, but you don't know what's going to happen in the future. There's no guarantee that that's going to cause us any happiness. Here's, and this is, I'm really glad you brought this up because this is the, the another really big issue is that utilitarianism depends on what the actual consequences of your actions are. And in a case like launching this, predicting the future is hard. Um, so I think in a lot of cases, like that we have strong utilitarian intuitions, we've got a mathematical calculation in front of us immediately who's gonna die and who's gonna live. But to what degree do your calculations have to take into account other things? Like for instance, if, um, if unbeknownst to you, Craig was actually working on the cure to COVID and cancer and everything else, such that in the future, all of these diseases would disappear. Oh, also Craig was solving global warming. He had just developed gigantic fans that cooled the entire, that's what he was doing on his island. So Craig was gonna cause uh, 
all of these different things to be good. Now, all of a sudden, it seems like our judgments have flipped. And if we knew Craig was doing all of that, maybe we'd say blow up New York City. But the problem is, you don't know Craig is doing this, and you're not guaranteed that mm-hmm. Craig is doing this. So, like, are you responsible now for deciding what's right and wrong based on your ability to predict the future? Or is it the matter of, be- even though you didn't know Craig was going to do this, you're still now wrong, unbeknownst to you, for killing the man who is going to solve global warming and everything else? Um, so, thanks for letting me know, June. Um, So yeah, this is another issue with it, is it seems like utilitarianism demands that you have some ability to predict the future to a degree that isn't totally reasonable. Now, you might say that what utilitarianism is responsible for is, like, if you're a utilitarian, you don't have to say the actual consequences. You just have to see, like, say the the foreseeable consequences. So the fact that nobody knows what Craig is up to doesn't mean you're respond like, it you're not suddenly a bad person for killing Craig if nobody knows that he can cure cancer or nobody knows the consequence. But what's the problem with that? What's the issue with saying that the right thing to do is whatever has the most, like the best foreseeable consequences? Yeah, so you have to rule out a lot of things. And here's another issue. Um, what is something that you are much more knowledgeable about than somebody else? Just give me an example of something in your own life. Are any of you good at cooking? Soccer. Say that again. Soccer. Soccer, cooking. These are sorts of things. If, if Kosi, who's very good at soccer, were to kick a soccer ball in a certain direction, he would probably have a lot better ability to predict the consequences of his action. So for instance, if there's a schoolyard full of children and you kick the ball in that direction, then you're somehow like, you know that you are capable of this and that a soccer ball can hurt somebody. I, who suck at soccer and don't think I could possibly kick the ball into these children, but then I like don't calculate how far a soccer ball will fly. Now all of a sudden what we're saying is, What counts as right or wrong depends on how much knowledge you have, which seems reasonable, but also how intelligent you are and how good you are at reasoning. If you're a very intelligent person who likes to think a lot and plan ahead all the steps, then all of a sudden your demands on being good are much higher than somebody who lives immediately in the moment and doesn't think ahead a lot and therefore doesn't think about all the consequences. That makes sense. We want our universal, we we like our moral theories to be the same universally the same for everybody. We want to say that if murder is wrong for me, it's wrong for you. And it should be the same for everybody. But one issue with utilitarianism, if you say that it depends on your ability, like the foreseeable consequences, well, what's foreseeable to you is different than what's foreseeable to me, which is different from what's foreseeable to the next person. And so now you have to start asking, well, foreseeable to who? the average human, well, then anyone who counts as below average, you're now demanding something that's impossible for them. Then the very above average, you're saying you can get away with stuff, like you can foresee the bad consequences, but you're still a good person, even if you know that building this new technology is going to lead to cancer, because not anyone else was going to know that. Does that make sense, everyone? There's just this really weird wiggle room tied in with tying it into foreseeable consequences. Um, So yeah, utilitarianism in some way, it seems like if it's right, you need to be able to predict the future. Um, (laughs) Sorry, there's a very funny chat about whether Batman is a Republican going on right now. (laughs) Sorry. Um, So yeah, uh, so this is the, so it's hard to predict the future. There are these practical consequences. There's the too demanding, And then there's this first thing of just like, it seems like sometimes you have to violate the minority for the greater good. And a lot of us don't think that there are cases in which that's true. Um, Another classic case of this sort of, uh, I guess another classic case would be vivisection. Are people familiar with the term vivisection? It's it's kind of horrifying, but um, vivisection is the, the act of performing an autopsy on a still living being. Um, So yeah. And so there's some evidence that like early medicine relied on some levels of vivisection to see how the organs were working. Um, So there's some question of like, does the medical benefits today, does it 
or like if we could become better at being doctors by if instead of giving trained doctors cadavers we instead gave them living people to cut into it seems like most of us would want to say no matter what the medical benefits are we don't want to cut open living human beings yeah um humans have been really terrible to each other for most of our history that's the other uh that's the other main thing that i feel like um is a takeaway of like human history is like we are uh we're both the best and the worst like and i feel this way especially with the internet like sometimes the internet does something which is just so truly horrible and then like the dumbest then like the cat lawyer video goes viral and then i'm like i love the internet <laughs> like just some of the stuff that's on there just makes me so happy Corinne. um i actually it's really cool that you brought that up because i was just thinking about this world real world um uh example that took place literally like for i spent too much time doing this this morning um i was um this and this is a, a flaw i think in utilitarianism um i was discussing veganism um with some fellow or with some vegans i'm like yeah, not, not the point um and even though harming animals is bad and especially like factory farming and stuff but i'm not here to preach um they were like, ah, this is this is gonna be looked back at the worst atrocity um, that humanity has ever committed. And they were like, yeah, this is like slavery. If you aren't vegan, then you are like a slave owner. And you know, I was like, hey, you know, you're not actually achieving like just in a rhetorical sense. You're not saying that um, you're not causing people to be more empathetic to animals all you're really doing is dehumanizing the victims of whatever atrocity you're talking about because like you wouldn't say ah eating a cheeseburger is like pearl harbor for animals because that's extremely gauche anyway i got uh banned and blocked um and they said that i was a carnist supremacist despite the fact that's that i don't one. think i've heard that before yeah, I, but just like they think that the suffering of any animal is literally equivalent to a black human person, which, you know, that's a whole different thing. But like how to quantify, like just basically different perspectives and quantifying yeah. death. So I think that touches on a couple different things. One of which is it does seem, so one thing which is true, I actually think there's three different issues that your example, um, touches on with flaws with utilitarianism. One of them is the, where was it? The uh, practical of not, how do you measure animal pain and human pain? Like how, how would you compare them? And it seems like there's literally no way of doing that. And utilitarianism seems like it's gonna demand that if we want like perfect good, we have to take into account animal pain, but then how the hell would you measure that? Another issue is this sixth one, which is utilitarianism, is rhetorically useless or can be rhetorically bad rhetorically bad like one issue with utilitarianism and i'm not sure if this is a flaw with the theory or just like a flaw with the practice of using the theory is sometimes utilitarianism is going to dictate like you have to so to take a, a real world case in which utilitarianism made it all over the news back in March, 2020, because it was one of the ways in which doctors began deciding we have one, uh, um, what is it called? Respirator. Respirator ventilator, yeah. This is the symbol, like they're shoving the pipe down my throat. Um, so if you have one of these things and you have to decide, well, what is gonna cause the greater good? This person's very old and probably gonna die soon. This person is young and if they get this, they might live for another 50 years, give it to the young person. So one issue though is um, using this logic out loud is not very helpful to the person. Like going up and be like, you're old, you're gonna die soon. We're not giving you the, the ventilator. Doesn't really prove the point. So as, as you were saying, like, even if you say like the amount of a pain being brought in, like pointing out and comparing atrocities or pain ends up having this negative effect and, and not getting like, you know, this isn't gonna make doctors any friends and comparing slavery with with car carnivorism, carnivorousness, I don't know, uh, is again, not gonna be very practically useful. A final thing though, 
that I think is an issue is that there are certain things about the human condition and particularly our relation, our special relationships to other individuals that I think utilitarianism has a very hard time accounting for. So a utilitarian, a human life is a human life. And maybe the amount of distress you have from killing somebody close to you is worse than the amount that you would have killing a stranger. But generally speaking, the difference between killing your own mother and killing a stranger is a difference in degree, not a difference in kind. It's still just a killing. It's just one will cause you more suffering because it's your mom. But in the grand scheme of things, that's rather minor. However, it seems like intuitively, there's like a, a gulf between killing your own mother or killing your own child and killing a complete stranger. There's something fundamentally different about that that utilitarianism cannot capture. Um, does that make sense as the final issue on this one? All right. So just everyone, I don't feel like repeating what utilitarianism is. I think you're all good on all that stuff. Everyone good on what utilitarianism is? Um, yes, thank you, Bacorin. Um, So two things I want to say. One is what we are going to be doing. So the original plan was to talk about the second ver type of, uh, what's the word I was looking for? The second type of ethical theory today, but I don't want to cram it into 15 minutes. Uh, I still, however, want you to do the reading for next time. Um, Next two classes are gonna be on what's called cultural relativism. And uh, I just wanna do a quick preview of what cultural relativism is and how it fits in. So basically the theory we're talking about right now, this utilitarian view, as well as the one we're gonna talk about at the start of next class called deontology. They're both of the view that what's right and what's wrong is the same for all humans everywhere. It's a matter of whatever's right here is gonna be right there because at the end of the day, all that matters is the pleasure and the pain caused. The one next week, all that matters is whether you're respecting people and treating them in a certain way, no matter where they are, what they are, who you are. But there's an alternative view, which is called cultural relativism, which is the view that what's right or what's wrong, not just what you think is what's right or what's wrong, but what's literally right and wrong changes from society to society, place to place, culture to culture. So in my society, if we don't have human sacrifice, then if I were to take kidnap someone and sacrifice them, I am doing a moral wrong. But if there's another society in which this is built up into their religious views, then in that society, I from the outside cannot say they are wrong. So that's the view itself. And we're gonna be talking next class about cultural relativism in the second half. The reading I assigned you is an, a reading by James Rachel, which is actually against cultural relativism. So he's arguing that even though there's a lot going for cultural relativism, he thinks at the end of the day, it's wrong and you should accept a different type of theory. However, before we talk about that, so just when you're doing the reading, be aware that that's what his task is. He's not arguing for, he lays out some of the arguments, but he, I don't think he gives them enough credit. And then he does raise some good objections to it. But what I want to do next class is first off, cover the deontology stuff, and then spend some time talking about cultural relativism has a lot going for it. And I want to like give it the time and attention it deserves, because I think just glossing over it. I think there's a lot going for it. And I think the motivations that led people to cultural relativism were very positive, good things. And I don't think it's obviously a wrong theory. So that's just to highlight. When you're doing the reading, he's arguing against, but I, we are going to spend some time arguing for, and I don't think he should have the last word. Now, the last thing I wanna say is the following about homeworks. Now, uh, homework six, they were due, what was that, yesterday, today? I, I don't care, I'm not good at this. Um, so basically, if you haven't turned it in yet, turn it in. Um, actually, no, I'm going to say that. Nope, that was good. All right, I'll be right up here. So basically, um, I am, the end of my semester gets crazy. And so because of that, I want to get the homeworks and everything done and graded. And basically, I that is one thing I do not have to worry about at the end of the semester. And I can give you a better understanding of what your overall grade is leading into paper time. So basically, what that means is I want to make sure that I'm done homework grading in the next two weeks. So next Friday, uh, which is November 5th, I'm going to make this the hard deadline for makeup homework. Hard deadline makeup homework. And by this, I don't mean homework about makeup, which is what homework six was, because a lot of people had makeup ads as uh, one of their examples. But um, a hard deadline of if you've got any homeworks you have not turned in yet, uh, be it you didn't mention it to me or because you need an extension or anything like that, 
if you've never talked to me, I'm going to have to take off a little point here or there on some of them, but I'm not going to like fail you or anything like that. I'm just going to have to take off some for lateness. Um, but if it's past this deadline, then that's a hard stop. Basically, I need all homeworks that you want graded this semester. And again, I'm not going to take off a lot of points. So like, don't worry. Like, it's not like if you turn it, you're not going to definitely fail it if you turn it in now. Turn it in now and you will get most of the credit. So turn it in by this deadline. I will grade it. I will take off a few points and send it back to you. After this deadline, you'll get a zero on it, which is a problem because those homeworks are 5% of your grade each. So that is a very quick way to fail the semester by not turning in late homework. So by this deadline, get them in. Now, if say you have a couple laying over your head, you want to get them done. And then on November 2nd, you get COVID or something, reach out to me. I will be understanding. But generally speaking, if I don't hear from you before this deadline, no end of November 5th, so this is end of day, if I don't have it in and I haven't heard from you, that will be a zero on the semester. So it's about a week from now. Again, if you need a little extra time, I'm going to be flexible with you. It's just if I don't get it and I don't hear from you before this date, then you get a zero on the grade book. If you get it to me before then, or you reach out and are like, hey, professor, I forgot to give this to you. Um, yeah. All right. That's all I wanted to say on this. I just wanted to make, make the deadline clear. And I will send an email about this as well. I just want to make sure that I've said it in a classroom setting. All right, I'm going to end the recording. Uh, stop recording.